it's sustainable. So I want to go through some of those things from your perspective and reference some of the things you wrote about in your I'll book. I'll add one more. Well, please. High concentration of al algae, algae, high concentration, because that's what they eat. They eat phytoplankton and zooplankton, and that gets concentrated in the gut. And if you think about the nutrients that are in seaweeds and algaes, it's a high concentration source that just slips down, chews up, and you enjoy. You don't so know you're getting, eating. We're getting the algae when we consume the oyster. Yes. Ah, if really you cut the oyster, when you, when, you, when you open up an oyster and there's a cut in the belly, it's a green-brown or a green-red substance within. And people are like, Whoa, what is that? I go, algae, man, the algae. That's what it is. Same thing with mussels. Same thing with clams. You'll see oh. that. When you cut that open, that's a super high concentration of that nutrient that ocean nutrient that you just can't get anywhere else but from seaweed well that's fabulous because i spend a lot of time at byron bay foraging wild seaweed and i've well, got I, I my own great. Line of supplements now out of real food and they always contain marine phytoplankton because i want to get all 88 minerals and now you've just told me that not only am i getting the the algae from the marine phytoplankton the minerals because, you know, we all want minerals and everybody's out there buying mineral supplements out of some, you know, minerals that have been put together by some scientists in laboratory, whereas we can get all the minerals that we need from the ocean. Marine phytoplankton has been where I've been getting mine from, but now I know that I'm also getting it with oysters, so that's fabulous. Tell us a little bit about what you call the mermaid's tear, because when we open an oyster shell, we're not only getting an oyster. Tell us about the mermaid's tear. Well, that's the oyster liquor. The liquor is the clear liquid of the oyster itself and it's a saline solution much like tears and that's what would be the the mermaid's kiss and the mermaid's tear would be that when you're consuming it different people will tell you different ways of eating oysters depending where you come from and it's always you know what your grandfather or your friend told you what to do in france they like to tipple off they take the little oyster they take the oyster and they they tip off the water that comes in when it gets to the table and they let this the oyster sit in the in the uh tray and then the liquor will come out of the oyster itself that's the true liquor of the oyster what's involved with the oyster when you open it is both seawater and oyster liquor the liquor is the clear lifeblood of the oyster it's oxygen it's it's everything that's nutrients and it's it suspends in the shell i think it's all part of it though as well it's that subtle nuance of the region that it comes from you'll get a better flavor off of if you contain you keep it all contained now when you're opening oysters um i know in our North American style, we have two major styles that's on the table, tabletop. So you put a, a, your oyster on the table and then you put your knife and you shuck it. That's how I do it. And then there's in the hand shucking. In the hand, you tend to lose all the liquor. It just drips through. I can contain that oyster liquor or the mermaid's tear uh, in the tray that I work with. This is, this is my oyster tray there. So you shuck in here, little thing. And in here, you get all this water and you can pour that off. You can save that. It's perfect to season soups and you can utilize different things with it i've gone so far as to actually make like a, a sport drink out of oyster liquor dull seaweed and uh lemon juice uh and a little bit of sweetener so you think about what gatorade is and what sport drinks are it's a it's a sweat replacement it's electrolyte replacement that you lose through sweating you can recreate that using ocean water. And the only ocean water that I can get in Toronto in a natural format is oyster liquor. And right. so I collected all the stuff. So when, I, when, if, when you open that shell, the oyster is sitting in some liquid, which is a combination yep. of the oyster, true oyster liqueur, liqueur and ocean yep. water. When I buy oysters in a restaurant or even on a tray in a fish shop, they're really in the shell, not sitting in anything. Obviously, that, that water has been spilled out. Is there any way that I can do, get that water back? Your, now, your style of oyster shucking in Australia and New Zealand is very specific to that region. And I do not know why or the history of, but I do know the technique. And it's you, you shuck, most oysters are shucked in a, it's a shucking house. It's a, it's a business, it's a plant that specifically only does oysters and they put it into a tray and the tray is then sent to the restaurant. The restaurant just takes it off, puts it on a plate and off you go. If you YouTube any of them, you can see their style of shucking where they pop the hinge, they flip the oyster and they rinse it underwater. They get the whole thing rinsed underwater so that it's free of grit. But it also then, it's tap water. 
it, the yeah. tap is on, they put it under the tap water, off you go. You've lost, for me, you've lost most of the subtle nuances of where the region that it comes from. But it's just how it's been done for hundreds of years. And they pack them up into these little trays and off they go. And that's why there'll always be this uh, sort of neutrality within the, the, the flavor. Now, if you can find a restaurant that fresh shucks the oyster there and puts it on a plate, not flipped, then you can tell that it's not been run under water. This goes back to the days of Paris and why in Paris they do not shuck oysters and sever from the bottom shell. When you go to Paris and have oysters, it's still attached to the bottom shell. The reason that is, is back in the early 1800s when tins, when, when oyster tins, do I have one here? Oh, it's at work. Uh, oysters were tinned. They were shucked at the ocean, put into a tin, sealed up, put on a train, went to Paris, and you would put them on an oyster plate. Mm -hmm. The plate was nice because the bourgeois, they had these lovely gloves, they had little oyster forks, they picked them up and eat like this, no shell because they're dirty muddy. But it had this tinny flavor. So consumers kept asking the restaurateurs, saying, this tastes too tinny, we need fresher oyster. So he would, the restaurateur, who was a smart one, would take the shell and take the oyster out of the bucket, out of the tin, put it into the shell. Here you go, fresh oyster. They go, no, 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 no. We need proof that it is freshly opened. Either you, and now they, they open in the street, they open in front of you. But when it's done in the kitchen, they had to leave it attached to the bottom shell. The only method that you can prove the oyster is fresh is when it's attached to the bottom shell, which is why in Paris to this day, your oysters will still be stuck to the bottom shell. Now, I had Parisian folks who come into my restaurant, Starfish, and they said, you know, we've had a great dinner, but I just want to tell you, your oysters are loose in the shell, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I went, oh, and I heard their accent. I go, oh, are you from Paris? Yeah. Okay, two seconds, went back, got the same oyster, shuck top on, left it, put it on a plate, couple of forks, and they're, they take their fork like this. Oh, it's so, it's stuck. Oh, this is the, the best, the best, the best. And so they, it depends on the culture that you come from and how you do it. So I have to find out in Australia, who was the first one that said, this is how we're going to do it. And it might have actually been even a public health situation where grit, sand, mud, wash it all off, and then you can serve it. And they just leave the top one and they run it under the sink, then they flip it and they put it on the train, off you go. That's why you lose the subtle nuances of the flavor. Right. So if you've got an Australian or a New Zealander coming to your restaurant, they'd be complaining that you've got ocean water. You haven't washed your oysters properly because they're sitting in ocean water and you get complaints. But we are losing a lot of the magic when we do that. It's where you come from. And yeah. I will always ask the stories. You know, down in the southern states, their people eat their oysters on crackers. They actually ask for an oyster cracker, which is a saltine, square, salt, plain, bland soup cracker. And I'm like, where? I, when I go, I go to the Masters, and I'm shucking it way to the golf thing, you know? It's down in, in the southern states there. And they, they go, yeah, I need to have crackers. Where are the crackers? I'm like, where do you live? And why did you put oyster on a cracker? It's in a shell. Well, I got to take it out of the shell, put it on the cracker. That's what my grandfather told me. I went, Okay, so don't argue with grandpa, but why, you know, you're going to lose a lot of stuff. And then he puts sauce on it and everything just goes crazy. But oyster crackers is a thing in the southern states. It's not so anywhere else in the world. So there's no, everywhere's got a different little story. And I always find it mostly fascinating of, of how and where did we get to that point.